much deeper, more sort of super abstract notion of the interrelationship between work and function. I, I did a, a video series. It's probably, I, I say this all the time that some of these lecture series are my favorite video. They're all sort of my favorite, but my grinding video is emblematic of this. The discussion that I did in my um, um, philosophy of hip hop series, grinding is this. The function of the work, right? What is the function of the work? And I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So number two, super important, super important. This is a direct quote from Heidegger. Nevertheless, we must ask, quote, is the structure of a simple propositional statement, the cat is on the mat, <laughs> is the structure of a simple propositional statement, the combination of the subject, and the predicate, the mirror image of the structure of the thing. Is there a mirror image between the propositional statement, the cat is on the mat, as proposition, and its relationship to there being a cat on the mat? Right? I discussed this in Kantian terms before, with respect to Hume's fork in Kant's synthetic a priori. Now we're looking at it in a totally different level, on a totally different level, and Heidegger is asking the question, rather rhetorically, and I'll answer this question later, but is there a mirror image relationship? And this really is a great question that facilitates a sort of cross-disciplinary discussion on metaphysics as existence, sort of discussions on reality, and epistemology, discussions on what we know. So there, is, there are things in the world, and there are things that we know, the question is, what is the propositional relationship between the cat is on the mat and there being a cat on the mat? Is it a mirror image, the proposition to the thing in the world? You would want to say yes immediately. You would be wrong. But you would want to say yes, of course, right? The propositions in our mind directly relate and correspond to the things that are in the world. The cat is on the mat as proposition corresponds to there being a cat on the mat. And I can't say you'd be wrong. It depends on what school of thought you would. Some people say you would be wrong. Some people would say you would be right. Heidegger says you're wrong. We'll see that in a little bit. So, what could be more obvious than the man transposes his propositional way of understanding things into the structure of the thing itself? Right? So that, um, so actually I told you, right, explain both epistemological and logical implications. The epistemological implications are that our propositions if you assume this position, right? If you assume the position that our propositions, the cat, right? The cat is on the mat, as proposition directly corresponds to there being, wait, I gotta remember how I drew the cat, right? Because, right, this is the classic cat is on the mat. I hope I did this right. One, two, three, four. I think it's like that. There might be a tail, but there being a cat, a little inside joke. <laughs> I think it was three skulls. I forget who made the comment, right? They were like, you should get this cat. Did I get it or did I not? <laughs> um, there should be a cat on the mat, which is absolutely, absolutely genius. I'm going to change my profile pic today to the cat, because I have this cat on my Facebook page. Um, so this is going to be my, and I have paradigm shift. And it really is a paradigm shift, right? It's, I love it. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's really bad when you can sit here and lecture to yourself, really, and then start laughing at your own thoughts. It's so pathetic in a sense. But it really is, I love the cat is on the mat. It is, it is, it is what it is to be a philosopher. It is emblematic of philosophy. I really, truly believe it. Heidegger's asking, yet again, another philosopher asking about the relationship between propositions and the things in the world. The way that we always, always, always talk about this in philosophy is to talk about the cat being on the mat. So is the cat on the mat? <laughs> Does that propositional relationship relate to, correspond with there being a cat on the mat? Right? So, number three. So that's the question. I've already given you the answer, which is bad lecturing. I'm supposed to let you think that Heidegger assumes that, but he doesn't. And now, in, in bullet point three, we see exactly what's at stake. Quote, actually, the sentence structure, the cat is on the mat, does not provide the standard for the pattern of the thing structure. Heidegger makes a key distinction. 
This is a sentence structure. This is a thing structure. And they are not the same. Never the two shall meet, right? The thing structure and the sentence structure, there isn't a direct overlap. There's something in the thing structure, and we'll talk about some, the thingly element. There's something in the thing structure which cannot or fails to inhere within the sentence structure. So there is a sense in which our words fail us. And Kant recognized this, right? Now I'm going to go a little, a little deeper for those of you who can understand this just briefly. Kant recognizes that the ding on sick is essentially ineffable. Almost also inconceivable. Fichte does away with this precisely for the fact that it's ineffable and inconceivable. But for Kant, the ding on sick is... It's there, conceptually speaking, we can sort of make sense of what it is, but the, to the totality of the thing in itself transcends, in a spooky sense, human cognitive ability. Um, and and it, it creates a huge problem epistemologically, but even, epistemologically speaking, but an even bigger conundrum, metaphysically speaking. It's like, you know, for the individual Kant who wanted to do away with metaphysics, he deposits in metaphysics the most the most profoundly bizarre conceptualization, which is the existence of the thing as itself completely transcendental, if you will. Right? It, 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 uh, one of the hugest critiques of Kant is the, the positing of the thing on sick. Right? The idea is that there is a, there is a and, and, and I, I, I bring this up just so that you can understand Heidegger's notion here, right? that it's very important to recognize that for Heidegger, the, and this took me a while to get, right? I wouldn't have been able to understand this if I didn't have the training I had, but, but now you can understand it for free, <laughs> which is the beauty of virtual education. Um, you can recognize now that the thing structure and the sentence structure don't exist. They, they don't, there's not, a, I mean they exist, but they don't overlap. I, Mark, I didn't mean to say that. They exist, but they aren't interchangeable. They're, they're distinct modes of understanding which relate to the sentence structure as epistemological, and there are, are distinct modes of existence that relate to the thing structure, sort of metaphysically, ontologically speaking, right? So that when we talk about, and this makes sense, right? I mean, you can, you can critique Heidegger all you want, but this makes sense, right? You cannot say that our epistemological, propositional understanding of the things in the world relate in a direct correspondence with the actual things. Now, analytic philosophers will go at this for centuries, right? The relationship. Contemporary discourse is, I think, very, very interesting at this point. Um, I'm running out of time, I can't, and I have so much more to do. Uh, well, I have two more to do. I might be able to get this in there. Uh, I don't want to force it, though. Actually, what I'll do is I will... Wait, let me see. Actual does not provide a stamp. Let me finish three, and then I'll stop, and then I'll resume in a bit, because I want to make sure I get all of this without sort of rushing through it. So, let's finish three. So, actually, the sentence structure does not provide the standard for the pattern of thing structure. Right? Sentence structure does not provide the pattern for thing structure. You cannot um, linguistically, uh, and, and for the for Astro Boom Boy, um, Astro Boom Boy, shout out to you, this is why you deserve the free iPad too, because I just loved your video so much. It's important to understand as a linguist, as an aspiring linguist, that um, according to Heidegger, the, the contents of our linguistic conceptualization, in terms of even in, in a neurocognitive sense, cannot be said to directly, according to Heidegger, and you know, it'd be interesting to hear a cognitive linguistic um, critique of this, or acceptance of this, or defense of this, it cannot be said to directly overlap with the thing structure, right? Uh, and that there's a sense in which we cannot reduce existence to language, is what this means, right? That's what Heidegger's saying. 